I want to encourage you guys to grab a Bible and turn with me to Acts chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 32 through 43. And if you don't have a Bible of your own this morning, feel free to take one of the hardcover blue Bibles and a pew rack in front of you. And you can turn to page 918. Now today our passage in Acts and, and the early church history that it records gives us the chance to learn about the power and purpose of God. But we may say, well, okay, that's nice for 2,000 years ago, but why is that something for us to consider this morning? And, and here's, here's what I think. I think for some of us, we need to hear this, and I want to hopefully, with the help of the Holy Spirit, show you this, because some of you need to hear about the power and purpose of God to comfort you where you are right now. For some of us, we, we need to learn this lesson and kind of, if it makes sense, archive it, sort of put it in the back of our minds because there will be situations down the line in our futures where we need to be equipped with this. And that's if you're a Christian on either one of those things. But if you're here and you're not a Christian, okay, whether your, your parents dragged you here or whether you just thought, well, there's no good TV on Sunday morning, so I guess I'll check the whole church thing out. Um, if you're here and just curious then I think this morning what hopefully, and this is, again, going to be a miracle, is that you are here because God wants to show you who he is and actually to draw you to his son, Jesus Christ. To show his beauty, his greatness, by giving you some perspective about the power and purpose of God. Now, I want to dive right into this. So, so follow along with me if you're there. If you're not there yet, keep turning. But let's look at Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 32 through 43. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, Arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. This is the word of the Lord. So, after having followed God's work, in and through this man named Saul for the last two-thirds of chapter 9, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, all of a sudden, the author Luke shifts focus for us, and we begin tracking along with Peter, one of the 12 apostles, who was also one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus Christ when Jesus was on earth, in case you didn't know. And our passage records two similar but incredible works of God involving the apostle Peter. First, as Peter journeys to meet and encourage the Christians who are already living in Lydda, which is a city in Israel to this day, Peter comes across a man named Aeneas. Now, we don't know the, the situation of Aeneas. We just know that he's been paralyzed, bedridden, for eight years. Maybe that was due to sudden injury. Maybe that was to disease. But he's spent eight years unable to move. And God uses Peter to miraculously heal Aeneas in the name of Jesus, which ends up drawing lots of people from the city to eventually trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. And then we go to Joppa, the city of Israel, but now it's called Jaffa today, where there was a woman named Tabitha. 
her, which was her Hebrew name, which in the Greek is translated Dorcas. I know we all think, stick with Tabitha. <laughs> but here's what we know about Tabitha. She was a, a Christian, a disciple, who lived her life doing good works and helping people in need. You know, at least the most notable thing that we find here is that she would make garments or clothing for the widows in her community. And, and we have to understand, in, in sort of the Middle East in the first century AD at this time, if you were a widow, if your husband died and, and you hadn't had children, you basically had no way to provide for yourself. And so you were totally dependent on the charity of people like Tabitha. So these widows are there, they're weeping because the only reason many of them have clothing at all is because of this woman who is now dead. So she's this incredible person, this incredible Christian, and then all of a sudden she gets sick and dies. And the community is heartbroken. And so some of them had heard that Peter was close by. So they sent two men to go get him from Lydda, right? And, and then, long story short, God works miraculously to bring Tabitha back to life. And as a result, the news of what God had done spread throughout Joppa and the region of Sharon. So many were eventually led to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what can we learn from these two miracles? In one sense, we need to take into account the power of God that's here. I know because of our postmodern lives and maybe just our own experiences, the idea that God can do these kinds of things is often dismissed, treated as a fairy tale. But take into account here, okay? Let's, let's back up and do a little bit of background. So this book, the book of Acts, is written by Luke, who is a, a doctor by trade. And he's presenting this historical account to a man named Theophilus, who was basically a, a powerful Roman official. And what he was doing throughout this was not making a, a sort of Aesop's fable for Christians. He was trying to account the history that was going on. That's why you see little weird details. Like, did you notice at the end of uh, verse 43 in our passage, and he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Like, if this was a fairy tale, that's a useless detail. But it's there, so he's like, hey, in Joppa, there's this guy, and everybody knows, oh yeah, that's Simon, that's the tanner. He's the guy who, who takes care of, of hides and stuff like that. And so like, if you want to go and talk to somebody to verify whether or not this took place, go and talk to Simon. That's what Luke is doing here. But this isn't just a fairy tale. Two communities were absolutely transformed because of the power of God that works in their communities. And the lives of these two individuals, but also those that... It impacted. We worship and serve a great God. That's part of the, behind what we've already sung so far, whether we're talking about hailing the power of Jesus' name or how great is our God. That's the reality. We worship the God who spoke and all that exists came into being. The God who right now is sustaining everything, holding everything together by the word of his power, it says. You know, this ongoing conversation that God is having by saying, let them live, let them breathe, let the birds go, let it rain. Everything he's holding in his hands and operating. He's a powerful, almighty God. And he's able to do things like this. You know, for those of us who have been around for a little while, like we, many of us probably in this room have stories like this. Maybe it's not necessarily Tabitha rising from the dead or something like that, but like, I know. I, I have people that I, I've grown up with and, and people that I've, I've pastored who were given like phone calls, uh, like those, the worst phone calls that you can ever receive and told by doctors things like, you've got a few months to live. And then go back for a checkup and all of a sudden, there's nothing there. And medical science is totally defied. It's not that they messed up. They're like, nope, here, here was the MRIs before, and here they are now, and we don't know what happened. Meanwhile, the Christians on the scene is like, we do. We know that these kinds of miracles can still take place because we have a powerful, great God. But also in this passage, we see very clearly that there's a specific purpose there's a reason why 
that God worked these miracles. In both cases, God was working powerfully in those communities to lead them to Jesus. The miracles were meant to lead people to the message of Jesus Christ. That he is the son of God. That he is the savior of the world. That he died on the cross and rose again as the greatest miracle of all time so that we who were far from God because of our sin might be reconciled to God and receive new and eternal life. But if I were to sum up my main point this morning, I think from this text, it's this. God shows his power for the purpose of drawing others to Christ. Behind every expression of God's power in our lives and history is because God is working so that people will come to trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord. That is our our chief purpose in this life now as His church. And so the primary way that God has done this powerfully and purposefully is through the lives of His people. And it's often connected to their experience of suffering, right? Right? So even though we, we know, in the end, you know, Anais was healed, we know Tabitha was raised to life, particularly if we put ourselves in Tabitha's shoes, like this was an amazing person. Like she's that staple in the community who held everybody together and cared for the widows and the destitute. Like the whole community was heartbroken when she got sick and died. And some of the tendency of that time would be to think, wait a minute, this can't possibly be right. This isn't fair. Tabitha's such a good person. Why would God let her get sick and die? But Tabitha's experience of suffering and her eventual deliverance was all for the purpose of drawing them to Christ. And so, in one sense, there's, there's two main ways that God works powerfully through his people in connection to suffering that I want to present to you. One that we clearly see in this text and one that I want to bring the whole counsel of scripture to bear for us. But, but consider this first thing that we see certainly in both of these cases. God works in power for the purpose of drawing others to Christ by saving people from suffering. That's what we see in our story. God is gracious. He heals, he resurrects, and people are drawn to Christ in response to the power that they saw by the healing of Aeneas and Tabitha. And again, I I know many of us who've experienced things like this. Loved ones who have been suddenly healed. Maybe us, suffering from chronic conditions and all of a sudden it's lifted. That does happen. But here's, here's the thing that I, I know some of our minds go to. We might read this and say, oh, that's, so God works that way so people can be drawn to Christ. What about me? Why hasn't my cancer been healed? Why hasn't my family member been saved from their suffering? Why am I still struggling with this? And and in our minds, that's where a lot of people jump to that conclusion to say, well, because God isn't healing them, he must must not care, he must be gone, maybe he doesn't even exist, because they think that the only way that God could possibly work is by healing, by saving. And I definitely don't want to give that impression, so allow me to also bring the full bear of the counsel of God's word Because it's interesting, we see a second way that God works to draw people to Jesus powerfully through his people that was actually established not that long ago in chapter 9. And at the time, I kind of glanced over it because I wasn't, to be honest with you, I wasn't exactly sure how to explain it meaningfully in the text when we preached on this two weeks ago. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just present the point and then I'll explain. The second way that God works powerfully in the lives of his church to draw people to Christ is by sustaining people through suffering. Now, where do I get this? In Acts chapter 9, verses 15 through 16, right? For those of you who were here two weeks ago, Saul was getting saved. Ananias was freaked out 
because he didn't want to go and pray for Saul because last he heard, Saul was really in the business of hunting down and killing Christians. And Ananias did not want to be the next person on that list, right? And God gives this explanation of what Saul was going to do, how God was going to work through Saul's life. And it says, he is a chosen instrument of mine, of God's, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. God was saying right there to Ananias that God was going to work powerfully through Saul to draw kings and draw people from all different nations to Jesus, but the primary way he was going to do it is actually through Paul's endurance and suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, from from what I see in Scripture and, and my own experience, I believe that it is equally glorious and miraculous when God empowers one of his children to endure the pains of life and even face death with peace, joy, and hope as if he were to miraculously heal or even raise the dead. I think that is just as astounding of a miracle. And particularly if you think about our own nature and certainly the norms of our culture, right? The second anything goes bad, we naturally complain, whine, we fear. We're, we're a society debilitated by crippling fear and anxiety, discontentment and despair. And when people are in the midst of the worst situations and yet still have some kind of peace, joy and hope, it is miraculous. And the only people I've ever seen do that are Christians who are clinging to Jesus. It's a miracle. And that miraculous work of sustaining Christians through suffering is a profound way that God works to draw people to Jesus. You know, it's interesting, right? That that explanation that we looked at in Acts chapter 9 was about Saul. Many of you guys know Saul later became Paul and wrote the majority of our New Testament. And it's interesting, as Saul's experiencing hardship and suffering, this idea that his endurance, God leading him through suffering, is actually going to serve that purpose. And that gives him strength and comfort. Consider Paul's words in Philippians 1.20. He says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Let me give a little context. When Paul, formerly known as Saul, was writing this, he was being held unjustly in a Roman prison. And a Roman prison is not like a modern prison. Don't recommend anybody go to a modern prison. Stay out if you can. But nonetheless, like there's still indoor plumbing. There's still books to read. You still have usually at least a few meals a day. You got none of that in a first century prison. Um, You're basically just shackled to a brick cold wall. It's wet. And you're just stuck basically sitting and sleeping in your own waist. Nobody gives a rip about you. And yet, Paul writes that, those words from Philippians 1.20. Saying, man, he he didn't even know. There could be just one, one day while he's writing this. And he knew that the Roman official who was in charge of him, who would put him in prison, could just say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this Paul guy. We, we need to open up his cell, so let's just kill him. Let's just satisfy the Jewish leaders that were really pressuring him to kill Paul anyway. And yet in the midst of this, it's like, this is my hope. I'm not going to be put to shame. And so with full courage, I know that whether I live or I die, Jesus is going to be honored. Jesus is going to be lifted up. And that's all the comfort that Paul needed in that moment. Now, in our selfishness and our, our lack of perspective, we, we usually think, well, I'd rather Jesus be glorified through my life by me being healed. I'll take that gig, thanks. But, but here's the thing. It shouldn't surprise us 
that for some people, the endurance of suffering is the only way that they'll actually see the goodness of Jesus. I mean, think about this. Look at Jesus Christ himself. Okay. Jesus, and while he's on the cross, there's people mocking him, right? We looked at this on Monday, Thursday, you know, getting ready for Good Friday. But there's people literally mocking Jesus, saying, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. They're basically saying, that was Mark 15, 32. Jesus, if you'll save yourself from suffering, then we'll believe in you. But Jesus knew something. That it wasn't until actually after he endured the cross and died that then the Roman centurion who oversaw his crucifixion and those who were with him said, truly this was the Son of God. That's Matthew 27, 54. Only by seeing Jesus suffer and die, some people came to believe that he was who he said he would be. And if he were just to be healed or rescued himself from the cross, there's people who never would have believed, even though they would have seen something miraculous. You know, another interesting quote from, from Paul that is helpful is Colossians 1.24. It says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Now, what does that mean? Filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions and his pain? And some of us, perhaps the, the good Christian in us, say like, wait a minute, is Paul saying that Jesus didn't fill up his... Who do you think you are, Paul? Well, one of the best explanations of what he means by this is, is given by a, a pastor and author named John Piper. He writes this, quote, There are people all over the world in all the people groups of the world as well as some in this city who have never seen the afflictions of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm going to fill up that lack, not by adding anything to their merit, but by making a presentation of them to others in my own suffering. My suffering will become the visible reenactment of the suffering of Christ for others so that when they see me suffering to reach them, to touch them, to love them, they will have a visual enactment of Christ's love for them. There are people in our lives who will only finally see the glory of Jesus when they see us clinging to Jesus in the midst of our pain. I don't know why that is. I don't know who that applies to and who not, but I just know it's true. You know, uh, one beautiful illustration, um, Charles Spurgeon will get into this, but you, you always know that there's, there's a kind of darkness that's required in the background in order for something light to shine forth, right? So it's been a long time, but uh, oftentimes when you go into jewelry stores, right, the background is usually this sort of black velvet, this sort of dark cover. Why? So then whatever light is reflecting on those diamonds or those gems, it just... It just sparkles, right? That's actually a good illustration for how God uses the suffering of his people to show the beauty of Christ. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way, quote, Our infirmities become the black velvet on which the diamond of God's love glitters all the more brightly. Thank God I can suffer. Thank God I can be made the object of shame and contempt. For in this way, God shall be glorified. I know there's a number of you this morning here or who are watching online that you right now are going through some of the most intense suffering of your life. Whether it's physical maladies, diseases, cancer, chronic conditions. For others, it's not so much physical, but it's sort of a mental or emotional Mental health is a real thing that many, even faithful Christians, go through. Some have lost loved ones. We're going through the progressive loss of seeing loved ones suffer from things like Alzheimer's and dementia. Seeing friends and family members estranged. 
And for many of us, it's a combination of things. And it, it just wraps around us. It's debilitating, paralyzing at times. But for those of you who are suffering like that now, understand that like Tabitha, first of all, your suffering is not a punishment. I had the chance to meet with a good friend and mentor of mine who um, retired from, from ministry and, and soon after uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember, like, I mean, this guy theologically is, I mean, so far beyond where I am. An amazing dude just knew his stuff. But in the moment of experiencing that suffering and that diagnosis, all his mind and his heart would go to is, I must have done something wrong. This must be some kind of punishment against me. And for some of us, some of you, there, there's perhaps some kind of suffering that you have, are enduring or have endured or maybe will endure in the future, and your mind will go to say, what's wrong with you? What have you done to deserve this? And there'll be this sort of self-depreciating shame that bags on with your pain. No, Tabitha was knocking it out of the park. Right? That's why, in many cases, from the outside in, the response would be, God, this isn't fair. Why would you let this bad thing happen to a good person? And the reason was because there were people who saw and were drawn to Jesus by all the good things Tabitha did, yes, but there were some people that wouldn't come to Christ unless Tabitha suffered and died. Yes, she was risen again, but the process of her enduring that pain, that illness, and dying, was essential for some of those people in Joppa to see Christ and come to him. It's not a punishment. It's for a purpose. And some of you need to take that to heart. You know, especially for those of you right now, because um, I, I know there's a number of you who, you know, I, I once heard, heard a friend of mine describe um, kind of age, aging and going through life as a series of losses. Mm -hmm. And you're going through that. Mm -hmm. and, and in many ways, the, the disorienting part about this is, is you know what it was like to be like Tabitha in the heyday. <laughs> like you were that person who was able to do everything, serve in all these different ministries, do all these different stuff, and it was so clear, this is how you're making a difference. And now you're sick physically unable to do the things that you were doing before for whatever reason, and there's this temptation to think you're useless now. You are not useless. There's actually an essential use for you in this season where all you can do is just endure and cling to Jesus. One author who, who I think puts this well is, a man named P.B. Power, in his book that's entitled A Book of Comfort for Those in Sickness. Quote, crushed corn makes bread. Trodden grapes make wine. Pressed olives yield oil. The frankincense that feels the fire floats upwards in perfumed wreaths toward the sky. The corn of wheat abiding alone is not fruitful. It is when it dies that it enters into the harvest ranks. The branch that bears much fruit is pruned that it may bring forth more fruit. So then, sick man or woman, do not mope and be downcast. Consider yourself not to be useless. For some of you, whether it's a season or it may be the rest of your life, your primary work to glorify Jesus is you just enduring with Jesus. To show the world around you the miracle that there is such thing as a peace that surpasses all understanding. And for those of you who have heard that phrase but are like, well, that just sounds like a fancy way to say peace. No, that literally means a peace of heart, spirit, that doesn't make sense. When your life is chaos, and yet there's this sense of peace of spirit. Why? Because your peace is in Jesus, not in your circumstances. Or a joy. A joy that is, is not like the world's. A joy that is full, unconditional. You know, in, 
If you understand Philippians 4.13 rightly, what, what Paul is saying there is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can endure with contentment everything and stay content, still have joy and satisfaction. That's what Philippians 4.13 means. It's not doesn't mean that now, you, you, because you put Jesus on your sneakers, now you can be the next NBA champion. But you can have joy and satisfaction in life no matter what's going on. Or a sense of hope. When everything in your life is pushing you to give up and despair, to still have a sense of like, no, I have a confident expectation that my God is good, that there's a reason for this, and it will be more than worth it in the end. That is a miracle the world needs to see. And the world needs to see in some of you right now. And I think at some point in all of our lives, the, the world is going to need to see that miracle in us if you are in Christ. Your time is coming. And I don't say that to give you fear. I say that to equip you with a sense of purpose. Because oftentimes, right, we're, we're Americans. We think that the essential value of our life is to be happy and healthy, and the second that something strips us of those things, we think, oh, what am I supposed to do now? Just curl up in the fetal position and wait for Jesus to take me home. No, if anything, I'd say that's when we lean in. That's when we say, this is where, like Paul, I'm sharing in the sufferings of Christ. I am now in the midst of my disease, in the midst of my battle with mental illness, in the midst of what's going on in my family, or in the midst of what's going on in our country. I am going to step into this, cling to Jesus, let him be my peace and love and joy and hope. And in that, people will finally, for the first time, see Jesus. Because for whatever reason, they won't be convinced by anything else than me suffering so that they can see Jesus. Just take that. For some of you, you need to take that. That's an immediate dose, okay? Throw that truth pill back and swallow it deep. For some of you, you've got to keep that in your pocket. But be ready for that. Know that that's the purpose of these things. Perhaps in the midst of our seasons of suffering, perhaps some of you right now, you're, you're just in the, the, the first stage of Aeneas and Tabitha's story. Some of you, very well, God could be glorified in your set situation because sometime in the indefinite future, God is going to heal you. And if so, seize that moment. You know what happened when the doctors don't. When your family members don't. You know what happened. So tell them. I prayed and the Lord was merciful. And the re only reason he healed me is so that I can tell you about Jesus, my Savior and Lord. That you would come to trust in him. Seize that moment if it comes. But even if it doesn't, especially if it doesn't, I would say, and the world around you, you're particularly maybe your friends and family that don't know the Lord, are gonna, maybe seeing you suffering is what's tempting them to think there must not be a God. Because them, they're such a good person. Why would God, if he's good and if he's real, why would God let that happen to them? And that's where you need to embrace that moment. <laughs> and it's your chance to say, my God hasn't abandoned me. My Jesus is with me. My Jesus is, is there and I am, if anything, sharing in his sufferings right now. And the only reason I'm going in that maybe is so that we can have this conversation because otherwise maybe you wouldn't be at my bedside. Maybe you wouldn't be coming to visit so often unless I were sick, unless I were going through this, unless I were hospitalized, unless I were in hospice care. For some of you, that, those moments with your unbelieving friends and families. That's the moment. But you have to. Jesus is leading you through that suffering because that's the moment it's going to take to lead someone to Christ. I'm not saying it makes it easy. I certainly would never assert that. And Christ showed us, right? To suffer and die on the cross was not easy. I mean, even the perfect Son of God screamed out in agony. Father, why have you abandoned me? Sweat, tears, and blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not easy. It doesn't have to be. 
but it is for a purpose. And hopefully that will give us the strength that we need when we're going through that. So if you're a Christian this morning, I just want you to you know, take that, archive it, keep it in your pocket for a later date, whatever you got to do, but take that to heart. But if you're here and you're not a Christian yet, here's the thing, and this, this clicked in my mind, okay? Because one of the things that I, I'm thinking through, both with my children and as somebody who's involved in, in ministering to, to students of all different ages and stuff like that, there's, there's a certain degree where, where you're tempted to despair, it's like, what could I tell them that they haven't heard before? And it, do, it just feels like it's going in one ear and out the other. What am, I, what am I supposed to tell my kid? We're on our third kid's devotional Bible read-through. And they're still telling me at 8.30 in the morning, I'm too tired from the go to church. I hate church. <laughs> what am I supposed to tell them? Do I just give up? No, and here's, here's what I, I'm realizing. I don't know. This could be my situation. This could be for some of you. And, and maybe this is an encouragement for some of you who are, are, are parents of kids and you know your kids are not loving Jesus right now. There may come a time where the only reason your kids' eyes are going to be open is because they watch you suffer and cling to Jesus and say, oh, wait, I guess this Jesus thing is real. It's not just something we did on Sunday. It's the only thing that's keeping mom or dad going. It's Jesus. And if so, we should embrace that. And if you're here and you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, here's the thing I want you to know. Like, I, the, the greatest blessing I could want for you and anyone here wants for you, your parents, whoever it is, you know, maybe the person that dragged you here, they want you to see Jesus. Because there's nothing better. And I don't say that tritely, okay? I promise you, I I'm, I'm, wasn't born under a rock. I've seen some things. And I promise you, there's nothing better. Jesus. But here's what I also know. I'm not going to sit here and say, so hurry up and open up your eyes and trust in Jesus. No. I don't know why, but for some of you, you will not believe in my Jesus unless you see me or maybe your friend or family member who is a Christian suffer. So I want you to know, and I hope, if that day comes where God finally opens your eyes, you'll remember this moment. And remember that together, brothers and sisters of Christ, I want to make this commitment on behalf of all of us. If it's going to take us suffering for you to see Jesus, so be it. Because in order for us to know God, it took our Jesus suffering for us. So let's just see how God works. Let's see what he does.